Good morning. It's Wednesday, September the 2nd. My name is Joe Haynes. I'm the preaching elder at Beacon Church here in Victoria, BC. I want to welcome you to this morning's devotional as we're looking at Revelation chapter 4. We'll begin reading this morning Revelation chapter 4 verses 1 through 7. I will only really talk about part of that this morning, but we'll read the whole thing, chapter 4 verses 1 through 7, and then we'll pray. Let's uh, read now, grab your Bible, and turn with me to Revelation 4, verse 1. And we'll read there, and I'm reading in the English Standard Version. After this I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Around the throne were twenty-four thrones, and seated on the thrones were twenty-four elders clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder, and before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within, and day and, uh, and, day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Uh, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this word of your scripture. We thank you that John heard the voice of God speaking to him. And you, O oh Lord, by your Holy Spirit, inspired every word that John wrote so that this is an accurate uh, revelation from you to your people. We ask now this morning that your Holy Spirit would open our eyes, give us understanding, that we might see treasures here that strengthen our confidence in Jesus Christ and draw our hearts to him, that we would entrust ourselves to you, Lord, to your Son, to his mercy and sacrifice on our behalf, and to your grace through him. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. I read a little further there than I intended to. I meant to stop at verse 7 uh, for reasons that I'll make uh, clear in uh, coming days. But um, but anyway, that, that uh, I was kind of getting into the reading of that, so that's how far I read this morning. As we look at this uh, passage, as we begin to think about this passage, we need to ask some questions about these verses. I guess one, the first question I'd like to get you to think about is, whose voice did John hear in verse 1? After this I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice, which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet, and he then proceeds to tell us what that voice said. Whose voice did John hear? Well, it's the same voice he heard when the vision began, and he tells us here, it's the voice that he heard at first, the first voice, which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet. And first, the mention that it's the first voice, and second, that it spoke like a trumpet, narrows right down for us whose voice this is, because that takes us right back to chapter 1. In chapter 1, uh, verse uh, 10, John tells us that he heard a voice speaking uh, uh, when the vision began in verse 10. And so look back to chapter 1, verse me, and let's look at verse 9. And we'll start verse 9 to 13. I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. There's that description, a voice like a trumpet. Saying, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamum and to Thyatira and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. It's the same voice that John heard again later in chapter 1 verse 17. Uh, when John says, When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead, but he laid his right hand on me, saying, Here's the voice, Fear not, I am the first and the last, and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. 
Write, therefore, the things that you have seen, those that are and those that are to take place after this. And so now I, I want you to notice a couple things. First, please notice that when John turned to see who was speaking, uh, he saw one like a son of man. And we read that in verse um, um, 13. Uh, he turned in verse 12, he turned to see the voice that was speaking. And on turning, he saw one like a son of man clothed with a long robe and standing among the seven golden lampstands. So that's the first thing to notice. He saw one like a son of man. And the vision that he saw when he saw this one like a son of man was a, a divine, glorious being performing the role of a high priest and standing among, overseeing, protecting, watching over, and ministering to his churches, the lampstands symbolizing the seven churches that we see in verse 20. And what this i guess the second thing to notice is is what did the voice say to john what instruction did the voice give to john well in verse 11 in chapter 1 verse 11 the voice said write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches to ephesus and to smyrna and to pergamum and to thyatira and to sardis and to philadelphia and to laodicea that's the first thing the voice said to him it was an instruction to write down the things that he sees well then uh the second time he spoke what instruction did the voice of the Lord give to John? And we see that in verse 19. Write, therefore, the things that you have seen, those that are, and those that are to take place after this. So then the voice of the Lord continues speaking. There's no stop here. There's no break at the end of chapter 1. The voice of the Lord kept on speaking and began to give John words to, uh, to write down. He was dictating to John uh, seven letters to real, real life congregations, churches existing at that time in John's life in the province of Asia, the province of the Roman Empire called Asia. And that's Western Turkey today. So the voice of the Lord kept speaking to John and what John wrote in chapters two and three uh, is like when, uh, when an Old Testament prophet writes, the word of the Lord came to me and and then proceeds to write down and tell his readers what the word of the Lord said. Well, that's like what's happening here. The word of the Lord comes to John. The voice of the Lord speaks to John in a vision, making it clear to John uh, that everything written in chapters 2 and 3 for the seven churches, every, every letter written to those seven churches, making it makes it clear to John who is behind what John wrote in chapters 2 and 3. Uh, John writes it down as scripture to these churches in Asia, and there can be no question who these letters really come from. It comes from the Lord. So now in, in chapter 4, verse 1, as we come to today's passage, John does something he hasn't done since chapter 1, verse 12. He looked. That's what it says. After this, I looked. And the same voice. Whose voice? The Lord's voice. The same voice speaks again. And what did the voice of the Lord say this time to John? Look at chapter 4, verse 1. Right in the middle of the verse, the voice spoke to John and said, Come up here and I will show you what must soon take place. Or sorry, I will show you what must take place after this. Come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. And... I guess the question we could ask, did the voice of the Lord, did the voice of the Lord say to John, come up here and I will show you what heaven is like? Did the voice of the Lord say to John, come up here and I'll show you what will take place a very long time from now? Uh, did the voice of the Lord say, come up here and I will show you uh, spiritual realities uh, that are always happening? No, the voice of the Lord said, come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. So if you read the next chapters of Revelation and, and conclude that this is what heaven looks like, you're missing the point. It, the voice of the Lord could not have been more clear. What John saw beginning in chapter 4 is about what was going to now take place in the future. What must take place after this. And so it's not even in the far distant future. But after this, what must take place next? And the conclusion here is strengthened by remembering what John wrote in Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, as he introduced his book. 
the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known, that's the Greek word, he signified it by sending his angel to his servant John. Um, and uh, as we think about this, we see that the vision of revelation which God gave to Jesus uh, to show believers the things that must soon take place, verse 1, uh, the things that must soon take place, Jesus made it known, that is, he signified it to John, he symbolized it to John, he gave it to John in signs and symbols for the sake of his followers, that, that his servants would know the things that would must soon take place. And so all of this is really important to understand what's happening in chapter 4 and on in the book of Revelation. Uh, everything John was shown in the book of Revelation, in the vision that he wrote down in the book that we call Revelation, everything John was shown in his vision uh, was given to him by signs and symbols. And some preachers and some writers and some theologians uh, will sort of uh, boast that, that they're the only ones who take the book of Revelation literally. But then they'll go right ahead and they'll ignore what John writes in chapter 1 verse 1, that this is a book, a vision that was signified to him, given to him in signs and symbols. And some preachers it, it will go on and ignore that and insist just as dogmatically uh, that it's almost entirely a book about predictions of the very distant future. Uh, only a few years, covering just a few years before Jesus comes again. And that the, those events still haven't happened 19 centuries after John wrote. So they ignore the literal instructions at the beginning of the book that this is these are things that must soon take place. Like chapter 4 verse 1 says, this is about what will take place after this. Um, and so it's easy for preachers and teachers to come to conclusions about what the book of Revelation means. Um, but we often find that they claim to be interpreting it literally. They claim to be interpreting it in a scholarly, academic way, and yet they often undermine it and ignore the details given in the first verses and even in the first chapters of the book. And so I, I think some preachers insist that Revelation is not so much a prophecy about the future as it is sort of a glimpse behind the curtain into the spiritual realm uh, and tell us spiritual realities that are always happening. But that's also to ignore what John just said, that this, these are things that must soon take place that John was shown in chapter 4, verse 1, things that must take place after this. Uh, things that must take place, those are events. Those are real events on earth, not just spiritual realities behind the curtain uh, separating this dimension from the spiritual dimension. So others insist just as dogmatically that all of these things are only far off in the future, but that's to ignore what John said, that it couldn't possibly be only about events that didn't happen for 1900 years at least. It has to be about things that must soon take place, chapter 1, verse 1, and about things that must take place after this, chapter 4, verse 1. That would be to take, if we read it that way and we understand clearly what the Lord is saying here, we can take these things literally by his words, take his words at literal face value, that the events John is about to see predicted by signs and symbols in the book of Revelation are about things that must begin to take place soon after John wrote it. I would suggest that that's the only way to really take the book of Revelation literally from the first verse. So, when the voice spoke to John, did, it, did the voice of the Lord say to John, come up here and I will show you what heaven really looks like? No. Uh, John in chapter 4 does not see the real heaven. He does not go to heaven. The Holy Spirit uses the real place called heaven as a symbol, as, a, as the, the backdrop for a set of signs and symbols to show John and so that he would write down to show the servants of Christ things that must soon take place. What, what uh, chapter 1 verse 1 says regarding the things that must soon take place. And that's why the classic commentary by Lang, John Lang says it's almost universally admitted at the time that he wrote anyway. It's almost universally admitted that he did not look upon the real heaven and real angels. The scene he beheld was symbolic. And that's why John keeps telling us about the signs that he sees as he says, then I looked and then I saw and then I looked and so on. The scene he beheld was symbolic. 
uh, after the opening vision of the Son of Man, of Christ standing among his churches, his seven lampstands, uh, and then writing the seven letters to those churches, what John saw next, he writes down for us. He writes in chapter 4, verse 1, and that's our verse today. After this I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. And uh, so after this, I looked. D did John go up to the real heaven? No. Uh, what he saw was signified to him, as we read in ver uh, chapter 1, verse 1. So what then does this, this, th does this heavenly scene signify? It might surprise you, uh, uh, just as it surprised John a great deal, that John saw a door standing open in heaven in chapter 4, verse 1. Uh, it's it very much surprised John. That's that's why he writes behold, and it's a Greek word uh, that means something like wow or look at that. Uh, and John saw this door in heaven standing open, wide open, and uh, John is lifted up and carried up uh, to see what what he what 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 is through the door, um, and what he sees there is a scene. Uh, that some, all the symbols that he sees are drawn from the, the Old Testament writings about the tabernacle and the temple. And he sees, as it were, a, a sort of a heavenly copy of the temple or tabernacle, uh, where in the Old Testament, God had met with Israel's priests, where sacrifices were made, and where, where God was worshipped by his people in the Old Testament era. And the symbols, all the symbols John sees here in chapters 4 and 5 are drawn from the Old Testament scriptures, and most of them follow that theme of the temple or tabernacle. So, John saw a high priest. He already saw the high priest in chapter 1. He saw one like a son of man standing among the seven golden lampstands, dressed in divine glory, but dressed in a way that's reminiscent of a, a Israelite high priest, uh, tending his lampstands. Uh, John saw the priest that is the Son of Man, that is a representation of Christ himself. And John saw the laver or the basin in chapter 4. He sees a sea of glass resembling the temple's basin of water that stood outside. Uh, in, and he sees that in verse 6. John saw the sacrifice that would be offered on the altar. He saw the, the Lamb of God. He saw there, there's no altar for the sacrificing, but the, in chapter 5, verse 6, the Lamb is there, the final once and for all sacrifice. John saw flashes of lightning and heard peals of thunder, uh, like when God met Moses on Mount Sinai, and God made a covenant uh, with Israel and gave Moses his law. And the flashes of lightning and peals of thunder probably represent uh, the, or uh, recall that giving of God's word, giving of the law. And so all of that to say that, that that law that God had given taught Israel about the problem of sin. Uh, like in Romans 3 verse 20, it, that law taught Israel uh, that Israel is held accountable by God for sin. All humans are held accountable by God for sin. The priests could not even enter the temple or the tabernacle to offer sacrifices uh, for sins unless they first followed God's careful instructions about their own sin. Exodus chapter 29 uh, details the things the priests had to do to wash themselves and prepare themselves in the basin, in that, uh, that basin of water. Uh, the sin offerings that they had to perform and the daily offerings that were needed before they could even go inside the house of the Lord and serve there as priests on behalf of others. The whole sacrificial system taught that Israel uh, taught Israel that there is no such thing as a righteous person, much less a holy priest. And the way to God was shut. The, the, so how could the door to heaven be open? And that's why John says, wow. Will you look at that? Behold, I saw a door st standing open into heaven. By what miracle was John allowed to go up and enter through that door? It's no wonder he said, Behold, in chapter 4, verse 1. The book of Revelation, we see in verse chapter 4, verse 1, is about the future. This vision is about things that must take place after this. The biggest human fear is fear of death. When, after this, when my body dies, when your body dies, when we die, will God accept us? 
But the future is hopeless unless we can know with confidence that God has accepted us, that God has dealt with our sin, that he's removed our sin from us and forgiven us. And what John sees in heaven is breathtaking. But the silence is deafening at first. How can a sinner come into God's presence? And the answer to that, of course, it has to go back to chapter 1. Jesus is the one who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. Chapter 1, verse 5. The whole future that John saw, that John saw is about to happen, that whole future that John was about to prophesy, hinges upon and is caused by that one history-changing event when the Son of God died to save sinners. Look at one chapter 4, verse 1, in the middle of the verse again. Come up here. And I will show you what must take place after this. As Jesus sent an angel to guide John, it's probably an angel now taking John up and, and uh, taking John to show him this revelation that, that, that is being shown to him by God's grace. That Jesus signified this vision to John by sending an angel to show John these things. And as John now is invited for the second time, he, he is now, um, uh, um, as Jesus speaks for the second time, he, John is now invited to come up and to see sort of part two of this revelation. He'd already seen the things that are, like in chapter 1, verse 19. Now he's seen the things that will be, the things that must take place after this, and the future things. And he's invited into the, the symbolic presence of God through this door. And the invitation is to see what must take place after this. And you might remember that this is now the second part of Revelation. We've already dealt with the present, and now this is beginning to deal with the future from John's point of view, from John's time. And so the, um, uh, this means that from chapter 4, verse 1 and on, it, the beginning of the rest of the book of Revelation now, uh, this is about the future. The things, as chapter 4, verse 1 says, the things that must take place after this. When was John living? He was living around, he was writing around 95 AD, right at the end of the first century. And that means we should expect that the events to be predicted now must take place and begin to happen around the end of the first century or early in the second century. So somewhere around the year 100. And uh, I think that's again to take this literally from the first verses of the book of Revelation. It's all about the future. And this means that the future that John was about to prophesy is not random and the future is not uncertain. It's anchored in the fact that we've already seen the most important fact laid down so far in the book of Revelation, the fact that Jesus, by his death for sinners, has opened the way to God. He has freed us by his blood. He loves us and has freed us by his blood so that we can come into the presence of God. Jesus has opened the way. And the many events that are about to be predicted, and some of the events are frightening that John is going to see and John is going to write down. Over and over again, God reveals his judgment against the wicked. But over and over again, God also reveals his love and protection over his people, over his church, over those purchased by the blood of his son. And why? Why? Because when Jesus died, the curtain was torn in two. The way to God was open to reconcile God to sinners and to reconcile sinners to God through the blood of Jesus Christ. And if you trust today as you listen to this video, as you read Revelation chapter 4 verse 1, and you think about this, if you're trusting in the sacrifice of Jesus, the death of Jesus in your place, and you're trusting in that that death of Jesus purchased for you, uh, forgiveness, that it, it, it brought a way for you to enter into God's presence, to be brought back to God, reconciled to God, redeemed. If, if, if it is the blood of Jesus that you believe makes you acceptable to, the fa to your Father in heaven, makes you clean, makes you forgiven, makes you adoptable by your Heavenly Father, then the reality that John saw signified, given to him in signs and symbols, that those who believe in Jesus can now enter into God's presence, like John did symbolically into the, through that door into heaven, 
then this is for you. It's for you. It means that no matter what the future holds, if you are in Jesus, you are under his love and his protection. He is the way, the truth, and the life. As he said, nobody comes to the Father except through him. But praise God that we have been brought through Jesus Christ to our God and Father. Amen. Let's pray. Father, uh, we ask that the glory of this salvation that is just hinted at in chapter 4, verse 1, that the way has been opened, that, Lord, uh, just as John was able to symbolically come into your presence, all who come through Jesus Christ are now welcomed into your presence. And we are under your blood. We are under the blood of your Son, that is. We are under your love and salvation uh, from the day that we first believe until the day that we die. And, Lord, there is no power on earth that is able to t take us and separate us from the love of Jesus Christ, our Lord. We thank you for this. And, and with what we face today in our world around us, uh, with what maybe what we are struggling with and, and, and burdened by, would you give us this, a renewal of this great hope that what we have in Jesus is not just for now. It's forever. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And so we thank you for this great promise, and we ask that you would cause us to rest in this today. And that, Lord, our obedience to you might be out of gratitude and confidence that we are loved by a divine, omnipotent love. We are saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thanks for joining me today as we look at Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. And uh, I hope you'll join me tomorrow. I hope to be back uh, with uh, as we carry on looking at the rest of the verses in chapter 4, uh, especially tomorrow, verses 1 through 7. Until then, God bless you.